Axis family. It's Tim out here at the Norway Ridge um, biking trails. I'm really enjoying doing some of my type of social distancing and I'm interested to know if you have some unique things you've been doing to try to occupy your time and still stay safe. Um, I've really been enjoying the a series that we've been doing about family and the one thing I always knew is that my family is pretty weird but it's interesting to find out so is yours. Um, this week we're looking for a brand new um, uh, um, series with family and what we're planning and doing is looking at two brothers that tried to restore their relationship. Now I know there's a lot of challenges out on a bike trail like this but I think restoring a relationship can be one of the biggest challenges that anybody faces. Hey, if you've got some ideas, we'd love to have you send video clips or pictures of what you're doing during this social distancing time. Maybe we can get some ideas from you. Hey, I gotta get out of here. I'm headed out on the trail. See you guys later. Hope access gets going soon. lesson series about atypical families. The first week we talked about the, the family of Ruth and Naomi and, and how even though they were, they were a bit weird, God still used them for, for great things. But, but the reality is, right, no family is truly normal. Your family is not normal. My family is not normal, but that is okay because God still wants to bring about his goodness through us anyways. And in fact, that is the very thing that we started talking about last week. How can we choose to be the good in our families as individuals? Or, or how can our families choose to emulate God's goodness into the world or into the community around us? And last week's answer to that question was by prayer. Atypical families, they pray for one another. We know that we don't have it all together and we need God's help to continue forward. But, but this week's answer to that question is, is by conversation. That is, not so typical families choose to have the tough but profitable conversations, even when it is uncomfortable to do so. Have you ever had to have a tough conversation with your family or maybe even a a tough conversation with your friend? It's not always easy to do, right? <laughs> there are there's some conversations that are just awkward. But then there are those, those conversations that are just outright difficult to have with a family member. And I'm talking about the, the kind of conversations that we have to have when there is conflict or when there's somebody's been, been deeply hurt or something like that or somebody's made a bad decision. Can you think of a recent example of this from your own family. Do you have tough conversations? Today, I want to introduce you to another story about a family in, in the Bible. This story is the family of Isaac and, and Rebecca and their sons Jacob and Esau. Isaac was, he was the son of Abraham, the guy we talked about last week, which means that that Jacob and Esau were, were Abraham's, they were his grandsons. But, but Jacob and Esau's story isn't the story of brotherly love or, or something like that. It was actually an imperfect and kind of terrible relationship right from the start of things. Competition, jealousy, deception, conspiracy, costumes, heartbreak, and, and red lentil soup. There, there's a lot of kind of weird things that, that happen in Jacob and Esau's life, but, but let me just kind of summarize a little bit of it before we get to actually reading their story from the book of Genesis. Jacob and Esau were twin brothers, but, but even though they were born so close together, they, they didn't really have a close relationship with each other. There was strife between the two of them from the, from the very beginning, actually. They, they wrestled within their mother, Rebekah's womb. And, and Esau was born first, but, but Jacob was born immediately afterward because it says he was holding on to the heel of his brother Jacob as, as they were coming out. 
they were they were born fighting and, and fighting for attention. And <laughs> they didn't really grow out of this attention-seeking attitude as they grew older either. If, if anything, all of that did was just get a lot worse. Esau, he was an avid hunter. And, and because of that, his father Isaac liked him the best. But, but Jacob... Jacob liked to stay at home and stay in the tents and do the household kind of chores and stuff like cooking. And, and because of that, his mother, Rebecca, liked him best. But in, in ancient Near Eastern society, the, the father's opinion was the one that mattered most, right? The, the father was the one who was in charge of the estate. And in a patrilineal society, one son would be the elect inheritor, uh, the one who would receive his father's blessing, meaning that they would be the one who, who had got the biggest portion of the father's money and possessions and, and herds of cattle and, and stuff like that after the father died. And this, this typically was given to the firstborn son normally, and that means that, that Esau was expected to get this blessing. <laughs> and of course, this was cemented by the fact that Esau liked, or Isaac liked Esau the best anyways. But Jacob had other plans. Isaac knew that he was going to die soon. He was very old. And he had gone pretty much blind. And he knew that it was, it was about to be time to impart his blessing to his oldest son Esau. But, but Jacob wanted that blessing for himself, and he wanted to be the brother on top. He wanted to be the one who got the most attention. So him and his, his mother Rebecca, they, they came up with this pretty clever scheme. Isaac had just sent Esau out into the fields in order to hunt and kill an animal to, to make a feast. And presumably at this feast, Isaac was going to give Esau his, his blessing. But while he was gone, Jacob went and he got right to work. Esau, he was a hairy guy. Jacob, he, he was not. But, but if Jacob covered himself in goat skins, his almost blind and, and very old father, he wouldn't know the difference. So, so Jacob knew how to cook as well. And they also presumably had some, some sort of game stored away. So if Jacob can make a, a nice red lentil soup and wear these goat skins, he could go into his father and, and trick him. And that is exactly what he did. Jacob tricked his father and Jacob inherited the blessing, the one that was not meant for him. <laughs> and of course, Esau eventually comes back. But the blessing, he, the blessing that he was meant to receive had already been imparted, something that, that culturally could not be taken back. The outcome, Genesis 27, 41. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And he said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near, and then I will kill my brother Jacob. Could you imagine being in a family like that? What, what a violation of trust, right? There was a, a lot of pain and deceit and cruelty in that family. They desperately needed to stop and have a heart-to-heart -heart type of conversation, but, but Jacob didn't give Esau the chance to talk. He takes off. When he, when he hears of his brother's threat, he runs away from home and does not come back for 20 whole years. He avoids everyone in his family. But, and after a while, God does give Jacob a change of heart. Jacob, he, he does realize the error of, of, his, of his ways eventually, and he knows that it is up to him to make things right. He, he needs to have that conversation. He needs to bring the peace of God back into his family. He, he's not sure whether or not his brother still wants to kill him, but he's willing to take the risk to do what is right. Here's what happens. This is Genesis 32, 3 through 11. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he instructs them, this is what you're to say to my lord Esau. 
Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban, and I have remained there until now. I have cattle and donkeys and sheep and goats and male and female servants, and now I am sending this messenger to my Lord, as in Esau, that I may find favor in your eyes. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, we, we went to your brother Esau, and now he was coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. In great fear and distress, Jacob then divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and herds and camels as well, and he thought, if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left might escape. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, Go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I've, I've only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. But then, this is Genesis 33, 4 through 12. This is the outcome. It says that, Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. And he threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him and they wept. And then Esau looked up and saw the women and the children and he said, Who are these with you? He asked and Jacob answered, They are the children God has graciously given your servants. Then the female servants and their children approached and they bowed down. And, and Leah and her children came and they bowed down. And last of all came Joseph and, and Rachel and they too bowed down. And Esau asked, what is the meaning of all these flocks and herds that I've met? To find favor in your eyes, my lord, Jacob said. But Esau said, I have already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob. If I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God, now that you have received me favorably. Please accept the present that was, that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need." And because Jacob insisted, Esau then accepted it. Then Esau said, let us be on our way. I will accompany you. Jacob and Esau were able to work out their differences. Even though it was tough and, and, and a bit dangerous, they chose to have that tough conversation. <laughs> but but just like a tough conversation changed Jacob and Esau's family for the better, being willing to have tough conversations can change your family for the better too. Every family has conflicts they struggle to solve or to, to make right. But, but atypical families choose to have that heart-to-heart -heart in order to stay in relationship with each other, having Tough conversations makes room for healing and repentance. They, they help us to, to learn to communicate and to understand one another's perspectives better. And, and they give us a chance to create a solution together that, that benefits everybody. They're important. But, but how do we have them? Well, it, it doesn't have to be that complicated. It could be as simple as, as asking, Hey, can we just talk about what happened? And, and then being patient when the other person shares their feelings and perspectives. Really make sure to listen to their point of view. It, and it's also as simple as, as being honest with the way that you think and the way that you feel, even when it's hard to. I know that it's tough to, to, to do so, but, but admit when you're wrong. Value your relationship more than you value being right. And in fact, I, I want to ask the same thing that I asked last week. I want you again to, to think of a recent conflict that you might have had with your friends or that you might have had with your family. Now, now imagine how that conflict could be transformed if you were willing to, to have a tough conversation about it. How do you think that having this conversation might change their perspective on the situation if, if you were really honest? Or, or how do you think it might change your perspective if you committed to truly listening? And, and how might you think tough conversations could, could begin to change your family's patterns of behavior long term? I know that it, that it can be scary 
to have tough conversations with your family, blood related or not. Our, our family members have more powerful than anyone or more power than anyone to, to make us feel safe and, and loved, but they also have more power than anyone to, to hurt us, right? And, and conversations like these make us feel very vulnerable because of it. But atypical families have tough conversations because they know of the good that can come from them. They, they know of the healing that can come from them, and they know that God's desire for them is to experience His peace. Hey, it's, it's Colby again. I just wanted to stop by one last time to just encourage you to again reach out to your small group leader if you, if you haven't already. It's, it's not too late to get in on the conversation about how to be the good within our, our families. And in fact, it was really cool to hear about last week how some of you who maybe have never had the opportunity to do so before were able to reach out and start connecting with the small groups in this way. That's, that's really cool. And that's just another testimony to it being not too late to do this. And, and again, I would like to remind our graduating seniors that the due date to submit your, your senior photo and your baby pictures and that short video clip of, of you explaining your future plans after high school, uh, the, the due date to turn all of that stuff in for graduation Sunday is this Friday, May 22nd, and that is coming up really, really soon. So, so get on it if you haven't already, because we would love to honor you and to pray for you in, in an informed way so we can kind of know what's, what's going on in your life. We would love to honor you in this way. But again, I, I miss you all, and I hope to see you all face-to-face -face really, really soon. See ya.